There's a myth going round town that when you get older you just sit down and start rocking. Just rocking. In a way that's true, if you know what I mean. Just take a look at the senior scene. Well, it's rocking. Yeah, it's rocking. We're pulling our weight, learning the code, clicking our heels, sharing the load. And every so often we're hitting the road. Yeah, we're rocking. Greetings and welcome to In Praise of Age. We're so happy you joined us, and I know you're going to enjoy our program today. It's with great joy that uh, Dr. Stuart Fulbright has returned to speak to us, and I asked him to return because he was one of the Tuskegee Airmen. So, Dr. Fulbright, we're so glad to have you back with us again. Well, thank you. It's indeed a joy to be here. In fact, I had planned to talk about the Tuskegee Airmen the first time, but I don't know, I just ran on and on about my personal life and never did get to the Tuskegee Airmen phase of uh, my life. So uh, today I decided to put on my red jacket and uh, uh, come back to talk about uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. Tell us about this jacket. It's fascinating, the pen and the emblem. Yes. Could we just spread this out a bit and see it? Okay, right. Uh, this uh, emblem is, uh, well, it really says the Wilson v. Eagleson chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated. And Wilson Eagleson uh, is the son of a woman who was formerly registrar at North Carolina Central. Uh, his father was uh, one of the early uh, football coaches there, even though they all grew up in uh, Indiana. And uh, Eagleson was a fighter pilot and uh, shot down two German, well actually he shot down four, he got credit for two German planes. Uh, and when a chapter was formed in North Carolina several years ago, uh, they decided to name the chapter after Eagleson. Uh, the wings are, these are the same pair of wings awarded me when I uh, completed cadet training at Tuskegee uh, back in 1943. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know how I managed to keep them this long, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's it. That's an heirloom, that's marvelous. Oh yes. <laughs> Uh, now, in case someone doesn't know about the Tuskegee Flyers, will you refresh our memory about what the Tuskegee Flyers are? Yes. During World War II, uh, there were uh, a lot of people, African Americans, who were clamoring for our boys, as they called us, uh, to fly. Uh, there had been some... Uh, uh, blacks in aviation scattered around and uh, primarily in big cities where uh, there was a woman, a black woman, who had a, a flying school in Chicago. At any rate, uh, there was a lot of opposition. The belief was that uh, black Americans did not have the intelligence to fly, nor the courage to fight. And there was so much opposition uh, to this that it was difficult. Uh, finally, uh, there was a decision made to start a segregated flying school for uh, blacks at Tuskegee, Alabama. Why they picked that, I don't know. I guess maybe because of the weather. At any rate, uh, the program was started, but during its early stages, there were continual efforts to get it canceled. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, as wife of uh, the president, made a trip to Tuskegee, and she was uh, interested in taking a flight with uh, one of the uh, Tuskegee Airmen. As it turned out, the person who did take her on a flight 
was uh, a man named Anderson. Everybody called him Chief Anderson. He was in charge of the primary flying school uh, at Tuskegee. Uh, the university, or well, it's a, uh, called a university now. Back then it was called Tuskegee Institute. They had a field called Moton Field, uh, and that's where all of the Tuskegee Airmen learned how to fly. Uh, there were a few who came into the program who had already had some flying experience, but for the most part, uh, most of us did not. After uh, Ms. Roosevelt's flight, she uh, helped influence President Roosevelt to influence Congress to really keep the program going. There were still uh, efforts made to uh, disband the program. Even after the uh, uh, first group of black fighter pilots, uh, which constituted the 99th Fighter Squadron, went overseas and had had some degree of success, uh, Benjamin Davis, who was a colonel, uh, at, uh, reached the rank of colonel at that time, uh, by the way, he was the only black American at West Point when he was in school, and he was silenced while he was there, which meant no other cadet spoke to him during the four years that he was in school. So he remained in isolation for four years? He remained in isolation for four years. He went to classes and did all of the other things, but none of the, his classmates, none, none of the cadets, who were there at that time spoke to Davis or talked to him. He was in a uh, dormitory room by himself and he stayed pretty much by himself except for uh, uh, coming in contact with others in class. He did that for four years and finished in the top third of his class. So that meant that uh, at least he made better grades than two thirds of the people who wouldn't speak to him. At any rate, uh, Davis came back from overseas and uh, finally convinced a co congressional committee that this should be, uh, the, uh, the Black Flyer should be supported. Uh, they were and they made a record that no other fighter squadron ever made. And that is that during uh, their uh, months and months of flying to protect the bombers that they were escorting. They never lost a bomber to enemy fire. Uh, and no other fighter outfit in the world has uh, a record uh, that good. Uh, being or becoming a Tuskegee Airman was not an easy thing. Uh, I remember when uh, I was examined uh, to uh, become an airman, I joined 21 young white men at Camp Crowder, Missouri for examination. And uh, they examined us first uh, with a written test. Uh, out of the 22 of us, eight of us passed the written test. And of the eight, only two of us passed the physical. And I found out later that that was uh, about it for uh, entrance into pilot training. Only about 10% of those who applied were uh, accepted. And then came the difficulty of getting through cadet school. I know our class started out with 51, or 56, I believe it was, and uh, 31 of us graduated. Uh, we had, our class was a little different from uh, all of the others. The class in front of us, uh, when it finally got to advanced training, half the class, uh, well, all of, uh, prior to that time, everybody had been trained as fighter pilots. All black Americans were trained as fighter pilots. Uh, the 
newspapers, African-American newspapers, started a clamor of our boys and fighters are doing so well, how come we can't have our boys flying bombers? And so they decided to start uh, a program of twin engine training in the ad ad advanced phase of our training. And uh, the class ahead of us, uh, they had gone through the first month of advanced training, uh, training as fighter pilots, and then the second month they split up the class and half of them continued as fighter pilots. The other half uh, went into twin engine training for, uh, to become bomber pilots. My class, they split us up at the very beginning of our advanced, uh, half of us. Uh, went into bomber training uh, and the other half uh, into uh, continued it with fighter training. And so that's the way it was for several months uh, afterward. And while uh, many people are aware of the uh, fighter group and its accomplishments, and by the way, the fighter groups after the war was over uh, they had a uh, Top Gun contest that used to be held uh, several years ago, and the Tuskegee Airmen won the first Top Gun uh, contest as well. Uh, another thing that most people don't know is that academically, we used to have to take uh, uh, examinations every week after, uh, for our ground school courses. Uh, the Tuskegee Group led the Southeast Training Command in uh, scores uh, on the, the uh, academic phase of uh, being, becoming a pilot. Uh, so that's uh, the way things were back then. We still faced a great deal of prejudice and, and uh, discrimination. And all of the guys we would cheer each other on. If, if, if uh, there was ever a time of uh, disappointment or despair, there were always the guys in your group who were trying to give you encouragement to, uh, to, to, to go on and, and uh, try to succeed. Uh, there were 994 uh, black pilots who completed the program at Tuskegee. Only, we don't know exactly, but the best estimate is that fewer than 200 of us are still alive. All of us are, uh, who are still here are in our 80s or 90s. And uh, I'm 86 and uh, hope to reach at least 90. <laughs> Good for you, that's a great goal. <laughs> but uh, we had uh, some great times, uh, great tribulations also. But uh, as I get older, I tend to think more about the good things uh, that happened uh, rather uh, than uh, all of the bad things that happened. Uh, one of the bad things that happened with our group was uh, we were stationed at one time in uh, Freeman Field, uh, Indiana. Uh, uh, approximately, I don't know, I think it was around 60 miles from Indianapolis. At any rate, uh, they had two officers clubs there. Uh, one that uh, we were uh, told to attend, which was a pretty good sized wooden building that had big heating stoves in uh, the uh, uh, I think there were two of them in that room. And we had some card tables, and that was about it. While the other officers' club was brick, steam-heated, all kinds of equipment. So uh, that did not sit too well with us. And we decided uh, at one time that we were going to go to the club. Uh, a small group went in at once and were uh, promptly put out. But physically? Physically or just verbally? put out. Well, verbally put out. They didn't uh, have to do it. The guys got uh, left 
uh, when they were told to get out. Uh, a, a better organized group of most of the black officers on the base decided to go in one night. And uh, somehow they knew that we were coming because as this convoy of cars drove up to the club, uh, we were, uh, we could see the white officers coming out of the club and they had closed it. Three of the guys that night did get up to the door. One of them pushed a military policeman out of the way and entered. So these three guys uh, entered and they were arrested. And uh, they, uh, they were given uh, a trial. Uh, two, for some reason, were dropped, but one was given a dishonorable discharge. Uh, they called the rest of us in to the office and asked us to read and sign a paper which effectively divided the, all of the buildings on that air base by number. And they had a, uh, one group of numbers were for the trainees, the other group was for the instructor personnel. All of us uh, who were black Americans were trainees, even guys who had fought overseas <laughs> And uh, with uh, the 99th or the 332nd fighter group that uh, earned so much fame, uh, they were considered trainees. White officers just out of officer candidate school were all considered uh, instructors. So uh, they made a mistake. At the bottom of that division of buildings uh, was a statement I have read and understand uh, this division, and we were asked to sign. We told them that we can read it, but we cannot understand it, therefore we did not sign it. They arrested 105 of the men who wouldn't sign it. Uh, and however, they didn't arrest most of us who were first pilots because uh, the commanding officer wanted to keep up his record of planes in the air and missions flown and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so uh, many of us were left uh, unarrested to keep the planes flying. The other guys were put in transport planes and uh, although we were told they were being sent to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas to prison, they were actually sent to Godman Field, Kentucky, a base that we had left before going to Indiana. They had a good time playing basketball and uh, reading and relaxing while we who were supposed to be flying uh, used all kinds of excuses to keep from fry, uh, flying. I had a lot of dental work done. Other guys had all kinds of Aches stuff, stomach aches and pains, all kinds of pains and everything. So nobody flew during the time these guys were under arrest. When they uh, came back to the base, they were flown back to the base, our base, uh, I don't, I'm not sure, I think about 10 days after they were arrested and then things got back. And what happened was, instead of our going to that officer's club, they sent the whole outfit back to Godman Field, Kentucky. Uh. Yes, where the only officer's club on that base we used, the white officers went over to Fort Knox, which was nearby, and uh, used the officer's club over there. So uh, it was uh, interesting and uh, uh, a friend of mine wrote a book about it called The Freeman Field Mutiny. And uh, it was amazing uh, the kinds of things that he was able to dig up uh, surrounding that, uh, the actions that had been taken by uh, the uh, white officers there was, it's just amazing what Who they wrote the book? Let's tell people again the title yeah, of the uh, author. Uh, uh, the, uh, the title of the book was The Freeman Field Mutiny, 
and it was written by a man named uh, Jimmy Warren. Uh, Jimmy uh, stayed in the service and retired as a lieutenant colonel. So there were uh, a lot of other uh, uh, incidents. It was, it was very disturbing for the fighter pilots. They had made this outstanding record uh, and having never lost a bomber. By the way, uh, the HBO movie that was made, uh, although there were a lot of uh, errors that were in it, uh, things that weren't quite true, but uh, one thing that they uh, uh, did get right, and that was that at the very beginning, white bomber crews seriously objected to being escorted by the 332nd Fighter Group hmm. until they began to understand that none of the bombers escorted by that group was being shot down. And then they began requesting the 332nd uh, for escorts. And I know I have run into, uh, particularly while I was in the service, uh, we were stationed at one place that was near uh, a medical center where airmen who had been injured uh, overseas were being brought back to the United States. And every time one would see us who knew about this, who had been escorted by them, they would come up to us and tell us how great those guys were and how much they owed their lives to them, and uh, it was, well, it was good to hear that from uh, guys who really appreciated uh, what had been done. But when these guys got back to the United States, there was a private, uh, white private at the bottom of the gangplank, and he was saying, Negroes to this side, whites to this side. So back, they came back home again. and right back in to it uh, again. Now, yeah. did Mrs. Roosevelt ever intervene again to help you? No, it, it really wasn't necessary. After, mm -hmm. after she did uh, her thing, which was uh, really outstanding, that uh, she had enough confidence and enough belief in uh, doing what was right. Uh, that that she performed that uh, little act of flying with a, a, a black flyer. Uh, the movie, the HBO movie, had it as one of the cadets flew her. Well, that wasn't wasn't true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just as there were some other things in the movie that weren't true. But uh, basically, the movie gave a pretty good picture of of that. And then, do you remember the name of it? Uh, the title of it was Tuskegee Airmen, yeah, and uh, it turned out uh, I was in the movie. I didn't realize it, uh, but when it was first shown, uh, I uh, at the tail end of it, they had tacked on some pictures of some of the real guys, and uh, I remember seeing a picture, and I told my wife, I said, look, there's uh, John Harrison, and uh, uh, I called off the names of four or five guys, and my daughter-in-law said, and there you are, Pops. <laughs> what had happened, they had just taken a picture of our class, and uh, I was on it. So that meant that I was, uh, I think, the last picture shown in that HBO uh, uh, movie. When you think back now, after all these years, what do you think were the lessons you learned from, from this experience? Uh, I think probably the, the greatest lesson I learned was that whenever there is adversity of any kind, that if you have some knowledge, if you have support, and if you have a desire to win, you can beat adversity. And that's pretty much uh, what we did. We faced adversity in, in so many ways and so many things. Uh, in fact, 
we found out with the bomb group that there had never been any intention to send us overseas. A general came back and told us one time that he knew of the great work that the fighter pilots had done and he was surprised to find out that uh, setting up the bomb group was just uh, to appease the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And we knew that the white guys that we had learned how to fly B-25 bombers with uh, had gone into combat while we were given one training session after another. Uh, uh, to do. So we knew that there was something wrong. But uh, this general who had come to our group uh, told us that he had pulled all the strings that he could as a general and that we would be going into combat. And they gave us our last leave and uh, they dropped the first bomb on the first leave, the second bomb on the second. So when we got back, instead of going to the South Pacific we were given discharges, uh, those of us who wanted to get out, and... Uh, uh, and that was that what was year? It. That was in, what, 1945, just uh, uh, when the war ended. As it ended, you were, yes. you're right. you were let go. I just want people to know that you were dean, uh, the first dean of business at North Carolina Central University, and there's another Tuskegee flyer here in Chapel Hill who is Dean John Turner. Some of the people may know him. Yes, He was yes. Dean of the School of Social Work, one and of the much-loved uh, He was a bomber pilot also. Exactly, yeah. so that there are two I in think he area. was one of them that was arrested, too. I'm he not was sure. arrested. He's yeah. told me the story okay. about it. But he's okay. one of the much-loved people with the university. Yeah, great, And great. I know that you and your wife have been married for 62 years. Is that correct? Uh, that's right. Yep. And you, you're absolutely devoted to your children and to your wife. Yep. So there's a part of you where you have your uh, ethics put right out front of you <laughs> and what's important. Right. And what's important to me is number one, family. And uh, uh, I think, I'm not sure about this, but I think that's above church. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Okay. I'm so impressed with your, with your ethics and your stance on life and how you feel about humanity, despite the prejudices that you've suffered. Oh, yeah. And I'm so sorry about Mrs. King's death today. I know oh, that's yes. hard for you. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Dr. Fulbright. Thank you. It was a joy being here. There's a myth going round town That when you get older you just sit down and start rocking Just rocking In a way that's true if you know what I mean Just take a look at the senior scene Well it's rocking Yeah it's rocking We're pulling our weight Learning the code, clicking our heels, sharing the load, and every so often we're hitting the road. Yeah, we're rocking. Well, I must be going, got a game at three. Then kids to be tutored, they're counting on me. It's a brand new century, and we're rocking. We paid our dues. All those years.